Okay, so in this video, what I want to do is make the connection through our algebraic processes with our trigonometric equation. All right, in this video, what I want to do is make the connection between solving algebraic equations and our trigonometric equations. So what I have done is I have created four different equations, but you can see this quadratic is very similar to the trigonometric. Uh, let's make the connection between trigonometric, quadratic, and trigonometric. All right, in this video, what I want to do is make the connections for you between quadratic equations and trigonometric equations. So you can see what I've done. Should I do more? I could do another one if I wanted to. Uh, yeah, let's just make connections. And the next one will be factoring. Okay, so in this video, what I want to do is make connections before between. All right, in this video. Okay, so in this video, what I want to do is make some. Ah, come on, these me. Okay, so in this video, what I want to do is make some connections for you between solving quadratic equations and solving some trigonometric equations. So what I have done is I've created a quadratic and then I've created a very similar equation in a, as a trigonometric equation. And we did that for two different styles that we're going to work on. So the first style is when we have a quadratic, and this is going to be typically a, po a popular way to go ahead and solve this would be using the square root method because we only have one variable. Now it's a variable squared, right? But we're just going to apply our inverse operations using the reverse order of operations. So first thing you'll want to do is add a 1, right? And then you have a 2x squared equals 1. Then we're going to undo multiplication by dividing by 2 on both sides, and you get an x squared equals 1 half. Now, here's where a lot of students make their mistakes, is now we need to undo squaring. So when we introduce the square root, we need to make sure we include plus or minus. Now, we can also separate the square root into the numerator and the denominator. So the square root of 1, uh, obviously, is just going to be 1. And then we have the square root of 2. Now, obviously, there's a little debate between you know, rationalizing the denominator or not. And up here, many students would say, why do I have to rationalize the denominator? But we might practice it with you in an Algebra 2 class, just so you can get used to the answer given you as a square root of 2 over 2. And one of the reasons why this is important, at least if you're following a, um, a class where you're going to get into trigonometry, is you should recognize this value. So now let's go and look into this in a trigonometric form. Now, it's important, the way that we write a trig function squared is by putting the square next to the sign. But really, we're dealing with the same exact thing. Instead of solving for x, now we're looking to solve for sine of x. Okay. So again, though, well, the nice thing is you're just going to do the same thing. You're applying the same inverse operations. We're going to try, instead of isolating the x, now we're going to try to isolate the sine of x. So we're just going to use our inverse operations um, in the same exact manner that we did for the, um, for the x. Okay, then you introduce the square root, and you get sine of x equals plus or minus. We can just use this answer now, square root of 2 over 2. Now, some people might say, well, now let's use the inverse of sine, right? It makes sense, because that's one of the big mistakes students will make, is they'll say, hey, let me go ahead and um, just go and use the inverse sine. We use the inverse of subtraction by addition. We use the inverse of multiplication by division. Why don't we just go, we use the inverse of squaring as the square root. Why don't we just use the inverse of the sine by using the sine inverse? And the reason why is because that's only going to give us one answer. We need to find all the solutions. So we need to think about the unit circle. Like for what values, for the sine of what values is going to give me plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2. And it's not just one value because I didn't give you any restrictions. So if you look at the unit circle, 
you can see these angles here is going to be pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4. But um, furthermore, what I want you to recognize is I could add all these angles. I could add, like, you could have pi over 4, right? And then you could go all the way around the circle. And you could keep on adding 2 pi or subtracting 2 pi infinite many times. But that's going to be a lot to write each one of these answers plus 2 pi, plus 2 pi n. A faster way that we could write this is take our first solution, which is x equals pi over 4, and say, how far is it to our next solution that's evenly distanced, which in this case is pi halves. And if I add pi halves again, that takes me to that solution. And if I keep on adding pi halves, it's always going to take me to a solution. So I can simplify this as a pi halves n. All right. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at, well, what happens now when we have two variables x? We can't use our inverse operations like we did over here. We remember, when we have x minus 1, x plus 1, we can just apply the zero product property. right? If you have a product equal to 0, and again, that's your main goal like when you're factoring, like get a product equal to 0. Because if you have more than one variable, you can't use inverse operations. You don't want to multiply this through. We already have a product equal to 0. So therefore, just set them both equal to 0. Now, x equals 1, x equals negative 1. So with trig, it's the same thing. Don't multiply these together. You have a product equal to 0. Apply the zero product property. Say cosine of theta minus 1 equals 0, and sine of theta plus 1 equals 0. Now, when you go ahead and solve, you just add 1. Cosine of theta equals 1. And here we have sine of theta equals negative 1. Now again, we're looking for the angles that the cosine, where the x-coordinate is 1, and the y-coordinate is negative 1. So again, let's go back to this unit circle. Now we go and look at the unit circle in this case. We see the x value is going to be 1 at this angle, which is pi. And then sine is going to be negative 1 down at this angle, which is 3 pi over 2. So this brings up something interesting because, yeah, these are pi halves away from each other, right? So should we do the same thing we did over here? Well, no, because 1, pi over 4 is not a solution of this equation, right? Our only two solutions are at pi and 3 pi halves. And if you add pi back to like 3 pi halves, it's going to take you to 0, which is not a solution. So in this case, what we're going to have to do is take our two answers and add 2 pi to them. Because if we do add 2 pi, it does take us back to where we started, right? You have this angle, you add 2 pi. If that's a full revolution going back around. So in this case, I can say theta equals, um, let's see, a pi plus 2 pi n. And here we could say theta equals a 3 pi. Well, let's do it over here. Now theta equals a 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi n. So there's not a simplifying way for us to do that answer. But there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is how you can think about your solving your trigonometric equations. They're very similar to our quadratics, but you can see there's a little bit of differences, not only in, in how we finish off solving them, but how we understand the solutions and what it is we are looking for. Hope you enjoyed, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Cheers.